Hey fellas, this is Vince Miller. So glad you're joining us today. Our topic today are three men who spoke up. Three men who spoke up. We are in our study through the book of Acts. I'm excited you're here. Now, before we dive in, uh, let me just uh, uh, do a little self-promotion here a little bit. <laughs> Please head over to the website today, beresolute.org. That's beresolute.org. While you're over there, check out the daily devotional. I want to encourage you to do this because I know that some of you are looking for ways to grow in your faith, ways to be more faithful faithful with discipline, this is one way you can do that, just by reading the Bible with me. In fact, right now, we're in a study on Acts, and I'm reading through the Bible devotionally, through the book of Acts, believe it or not. So you can study this with me, but you can also follow the devotionals online as well. They're just like this video, except a lot shorter, a little bit more sweet and to the point, is what I say. Short, sweet, to the point. You're going to love them. Sign up for them today over at BeResolute.org. And with that, let's dive into our message today. Three men who spoke up. Well, guys, you know, the story of the Bible is a story about a God who makes men. He even makes men very good. But not long after man is created, man blows it by failing to act and speak in obedience to God. And this results in a separation between God and man. And therefore, God begins this all-out search for a man who will act and speak on his behalf. And in his search, well, we discover he comes up empty. So God provides his own man, his son, perfect man, who speaks and acts on his behalf. His name was Jesus. And Jesus models the way for all mankind. And in the end, as Jesus departs, he leaves us with something. He leaves us with a helper, the Holy Spirit, who gives us, as men, the supernatural power and direction to speak up and to act on God's behalf. And this is what I love about the book of Acts. We get to see men, for the first time, filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking up and acting out in ways that are born of a supernatural effort. And today we're going to look at three of these men who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who speak up, and stand up as God intended. The first I want to take a look at today is actually Peter. I call him Peter the Bold, and I'm going to read three texts uh, from some of his discourse and some of his history so we can get a good feel for who he is. Here's the first text. is from Acts chapter 2. I'm going to be reading verses 38 and 39. Peter said this, by the way. He said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Next, jumping over to Acts chapter 3, verses 19 through 20, Peter preaches again. He says this, Repent therefore and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you. And then finally, Acts chapter 4, more of an observation here from the crowds. Luke, the writer, says this, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. You know, as Acts begins, on center stage is the promised Holy Spirit. The unveiling of the Spirit to the world leaves well, it leaves a lot of these people baffled, especially the Jewish people. Yet we notice that they're mysteriously drawn to the power and the works of the Spirit. And so Peter will be the first to clarify uh, the revelation and the power and the mysteries about this Holy Spirit. Just to catch you up with the context here, it's been about 50 days since the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus spent several weeks appearing to hundreds of people, and now he has ascended to heaven. But part of his plan is not to leave believers alone, right? He leaves them with the Holy Spirit. And thus, as we watch, men are transformed, like Peter. Just notice the transformation in his life. In this short period of time, <laughs> Peter has gone from being self-reliant to a coward to restored and now indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And from this moment forward, we're going to see uh, uh, um, and witness a, a major change in Peter. A man who is bold now in attitude and action. And fellas, it's noticeable. I mean, seriously noticeable. Even in these first moments, Peter launches into a preaching career. I mean, it's just almost suddenly. And he's preaching right on the temple grounds, a place where over the last 50 days, there's been a lot of opposition to the message of Christ. 
but he is a man possessed, right? <laughs> By a new spirit. And he preaches a controversial message in a controversial location. One that circles a rather combatant theme of repentance. Now, both messages that we read about here in Acts 2 and 3 center around a single thesis statement. It's, his, it's this, repent. <laughs> How about that for a thesis? And you would think uh, the fear of persecution in this message and pressure from religious officials and the intensity of the message would silence Peter, but it doesn't. <laughs> in fact, the results of his boldness are impressive. People are healed. Crowds are mesmerized, thousands repent, thousands are baptized, and momentum builds in this young church. But don't go, get overly focused on the results as if it's something that Peter did. This is not something that Peter did. The Holy Spirit did all these things. It's a spirit that healed people. It's a spirit that mesmerized people. It's a spirit that led people to repentance and salvation. In fact, you will notice that the people in the crowds recognize that Peter's just a comment. An uneducated man, there's nothing special about him other than he's indwelled by the Holy Spirit. So, fellas, what made Peter bold here? Made him Peter the Bold? <laughs> because I don't know about you, but I'm drawn to this trait about Peter. I mean, I want to be this guy. I want to be just as bold as he is for God. And I want to get big things done for God. And I believe the boldness of Peter is an admirable trait to desire. And I think you desire it. But unfortunately, we wrongly believe that boldness, Christian boldness, is something that we can muster up from within ourselves by our own strength. But this is a misunderstanding about boldness and even Christian boldness. You see, boldness in a biblical sense is not something that we can manufacture from human effort. Contrary to how the world tries to manufacture it, it's not something mustered from self-will, positive self-talk. <laughs> it's also not a personality trait, by the way. Rather, boldness is something that flows from a vibrant connection with the Holy Spirit and acts in line with God's truth against some opposing force. Thus, when biblical boldness is revealed, it may appear to the world that we're acting out of our own accord, but really we're prompted by the Spirit and acting in line with God's truth. Thus, what others may perceive as human boldness is actually the Holy Spirit acting and speaking through us, through us. It's the Spirit's power, His wisdom, and His voice displayed boldly through us. This means any man who is indwelled by the Holy Spirit can speak up in Christ. And yes, action is required, but the action is actually what God wants, right? The actions and attitudes are entirely in line with the spirit of truth, and thus you get supernatural results when you do that. So if you're ready to speak up more boldly in your life today, simply speak what God wants. And a good place to begin is with speaking up more boldly to your wayward desires. You know, we have dozens, right? If not hundreds of times every day that our desires are out of line with God's desires. If you want to get more bold, Simply preach to the desires that you have that are not in line with God's desire. Start preaching to them. And this is where we all need to begin with the prompting of the Holy Spirit against human desires, against our ungodly desires. And as you get some practice with this, then go more public with your preaching. Start with being a little bolder with friends maybe, maybe family members about your beliefs on relevant issues. And when you're ready, Speak boldly to those who need to know the truth about their sin and need for repentance. Start small, take some steps, <laughs> and discover what Peter came to be. Peter, the bold. Now, next we're going to come to Stephen. I'm going to call him Stephen the Challenger. I love this guy. I think he's one of the great heroes of the faith. Stephen is an interesting disciple because he makes a quick rise to biblical fame and then burns really quick and hot for God and then becomes dead. <laughs> Here are a couple of verses that describe him. First, I'm going to be turning to Acts chapter 6 and we're going to look at verses 8 through 10. It says this, And Stephen, 
full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand, notice this, the wisdom and the spirit by which he was preaching. Next, we're going to turn to Acts chapter 7, verses 51 and 53. This is Stephen preaching now. He says this. He says, you stiff-necked people, <laughs> uncircumcised in your heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Ouch. You're as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as it was delivered by angels and did not keep it. Woo! <laughs> now some men are called to speak up for God in some very challenging ways, as Stephen did right here. You know, I have a few friends like this. I would describe each of these men in this way. Intelligent, low on empathy, and strong on opinion, right? <laughs> and they can say things at times and in ways that stings. But you know what? There is something about these men. For some reason, I am drawn to them because they do things that Sometimes I cannot, and I love them for it. I actually love them for it. You know, some men are called to intense and challenging moments, are they not? It's as if they were designed for confrontation. Even in the Bible, we read about men who are, who are called to incredibly intense confrontation. Moses, who challenged Pharaoh. Elijah, who challenged Ahab. David, who challenged Goliath. Even Jesus, who challenged religious leaders. But how does the average man do this, right? What's interesting as you read the Bible is we learn that by being a Christian, we by default will and must confront. In fact, confrontation is a New Testament mandate. I want you to listen to Matthew at chapter 18 here. Listen to this. It says this, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, you will notice here that it is the offended who's required to confront, right? <laughs> Think about that for a second. It's the person that's offended that's required to do something about someone who has made an offense. This means the obedient guy is called and required to say something to the disobedient guy, right? It's really interesting in this context. And this is the nature of discipleship, fellows, that we're always correcting, actually. We are correcting ourselves and we are correcting others. And we do it for the purpose of drawing people back to Christ, by the way. Not to prove our point or to elevate our righteousness. That's not what it's about. Because you see, the hope in Matthew 18, which is teaching from Jesus, is that correction will lead to repentance. That's what we're hoping for. The hope is not step three, putting them out of community. No. The hope is that the offender will soften their stubborn hearts, become receptive, and reconcile with God and others. So now, let's go back to Stephen for a second. <laughs> Listen to what he says to the religious leaders again. It's so good. I mean, it's so strong. I've already read it, but let's just read it one more time. He says this, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in your heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? <laughs> Notice the issue. The issue here is stubbornness. They're stiff-necked. They have a history of being stiff-necked and resistant to God. And Stephen brings a strong and confrontational message to a historically stubborn people. Again, the hope is change, but the result is death for Stephen. And this is the issue with confrontation, is it not? It sometimes results in, well, things that are less than desirable. <laughs> Therefore, many avoid this altogether, but we cannot go through life as a Christian without some confrontation, right? At some point, we're going to need to confront something, something within ourselves or something within 
others. You know, the Bible overall is a book of confrontation. Uh, listen to 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. Many of you know these words already. Here's how it reads. Paul says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And the life that we live is a call to self-confrontation. Do you remember Matthew 16, verse 24? Many, many of you remember these words. I just Maybe you recall them. They go like this. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and then what? Follow me. Well, this is all about confrontation of ourself, is it not? You know, eventually we will all have to confront something. It begins with ourselves. For some of us, this may come in the form of many small moments. For others, it may come in a major life-changing confrontation with Jesus, like it was for Paul and many others. Either way, we have to remember that when this happens, that it's the Spirit speaking through us for the hopeful benefit of ourselves and others. But the nuance here is that confrontation could have a huge cost. It could cost us our comforts, our livelihood, or even our life. And as Jesus taught, there are these moments that we're going to have to count the cost. And, and, and given a quick cost-benefit analysis, I think it's best to live by the principle that Jesus taught. That Jesus taught, actually, the Apostle Paul. That to live is to live for Christ, and to die is to gain. Now, our third man here we want to look at is Philip the Adventurer. And I find him to be quite interesting in the book of Acts. He's the last man we're going to look at today. And there are a few verses that I think really sum up the short, really short history that we have of the man named Philip. First, we're going to turn to Acts chapter 8, verse 5. It reads this way. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. Second, I want to look at Acts chapter 8, also verses 26 through 29. It says this, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south and to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and he went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah, and the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. And the third text we're going to look at today is Acts 8, verses 39 through 40. It reads this way. And when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through preaching the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Now, uh, Philip is a man who is definitely an adventurer, right? His journey begins in Jerusalem. Next, we find him in Samaria. Following that, he heads down toward Egypt, and then he makes this abrupt turn north to Caesarea. And Philip talks to everybody. <laughs> there is no one to whom he is not willing to talk. The rejected from Samaria, the rich and famous from Ethiopia, and then to people from every literal town on the way back up the coast. <laughs> but I think what's interesting about Philip is how he's being led by the Spirit. You know, for some of us, he may seem to be a little carried away, <laughs> which is how Luke is describing it, by the way. And I think there are some Christian men who are spiritually adventurous, like Philip, men who live almost reckless lives for Jesus Christ, men who are hard to put into a nice theological box. And I like that they are. <laughs> they test the reason of the safe and cautious, calculated Christian. <laughs> and we notice that Philip has gone alone to a lot of these places, freely led by the Spirit, and so he paves the way for the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, the one thing that's hard to tell is how Philip was hearing and experiencing the voice of the Spirit. I kind of wonder what this is like for him. But I love that he just went with it. He didn't try to convince himself that the Spirit and his leading wasn't real, right? He didn't talk himself out of following the voice of the Spirit. 
far south to the desert or far north to an ostracized people. He just followed and was obedient moment to moment. And as a result, he experienced adventure and lived a very adventurous and remarkable life. I think this brings us to some key aspects to really living adventurously by the Spirit. First, you really need to be free from the obligations of the world to do this, right? Second, we need to have an ear for the Spirit. Third, we need to be willing to do some, well, apparently unreasonable things. <laughs> now, while all these things sound extreme, they're really not. This is exactly what we're called to do, to be men who follow God, free from the world, sensitive to the Spirit, and willing to do anything for God. And, well, we just do this day to day, from one adventure to the next, and along the way, <laughs> This usually challenges those who are, well, less than adventurous to become more adventurous. You know, in closing off this lesson, here's at least one commonality in these three men that spoke up and did great work for God. They were men listening and being led by the Spirit. And that's where we began and should end today. The question I think this forces us to consider is this. Are you going through the motions of a spiritual life or are you actively, rather actively, listening and being led by the Holy Spirit? That's the question. I think the big one from today. And based on what I read here, the Spirit results in bold, confrontational, and adventurous men who make a difference for the kingdom. So fellas, get out there today and don't be average. Be extraordinary, led by the extraordinary power of the Holy Spirit. Love you guys. See you right back here next time.